they're confused. They're like, this should be easier. Why is this so difficult? There can't be that much time, effort, or money required to do these things. And so mm -hmm. it's very misunderstood. Welcome to Endless Coffee Cup, a regular discussion of marketing news, culture, and media for our complex digital lifestyle. Join Matt Bailey as he engages in conversation to find insights beyond the latest headlines and deeper understanding for those involved in marketing. Grab a cup of coffee, have a seat, and thanks for joining. Well, hello and welcome, dear listener, to another episode of the Endless Coffee Cup podcast. As always, I'm your host, Matt Bailey, and continuing our discussions about digital marketing education and the surrounding world of digital marketing. Well, here to continue that conversation, we've had her on before, Jennifer Radke from the National Institute of Social Media. Jennifer, how are you doing today? I am doing great, Matt. Thank you so much for having me back. I look forward to chatting today. Oh, absolutely. I, you know, our conversation earlier, we focused on certifications and certificates and defining that. And really, I think that went over really well because it helped people understand exactly what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And, but also I think it has helped with a larger conversation of professional development especially in the digital realm. And you are, you know, right in the center of that with certification of social media. And I want to dive much more today into social media as a career path. You know, this is right where you're at. And also from the education side, I see a lot of this. And, you know, speaking at a conference where I think we probably had 30 social media managers from major brands and being able to hear from them what they deal with, what they, you know, what they're not able to access, you know, there's, it's, I mean, here's my perception, Jennifer, is this unique little subset mm -hmm. of digital marketing and it's completely misunderstood. It amazes me just how different someone working full-time in social media, their experience as opposed to other people in other digital marketing disciplines. Is this what, and so that's my question, is this what you see? And what are some of those factors that add to that? Yeah, a hundred percent, that is what we're seeing. And we're seeing it as a trend as well. So we do a job study every two years and we poll people in social media marketing and we find out that this is something that is very different than what we're seeing in other areas of digital marketing. And there's a couple of reasons we believe filter to the top, right? One is it's changing so quickly and the platforms or the tools that we're using are changing so quickly where mm. digital marketing as a whole, we've used things like email, online advertising, you know, the big players, Google and Bing for your search engine stuff, but social, it's 3000 plus social media platforms, depending on, you know, what niche you want to jump on at this very second. And people are saying you need to be here and do this. And each of them function a little bit differently. That is one. I think the second piece is that a lot of folks in business leadership have figured out what digital marketing is as a bigger picture brand. They can kind of wrap their head around the tactics and skills required. But for social, because we use it for both personal and professional, mm. they're confused. They're like, this should be easier. Why is this so difficult? There can't be that much time, effort, or money required to do these things. And so mm -hmm. it's very misunderstood. Absolutely. I am, I was trying to think of, you know, almost a metaphor for what social media marketers go through because, and, and really the only thing I could come up with is fantasy football, that football was a game, but now you have fantasy football. And if a player has a bad game, Twitter just erupts about this player who's expected. And so now they're not just being judged according to a team and how the team did. The team could win. And yet this player is getting hounded on social media and a weak metaphor, but spare me, you know, <laughs> but no, it's good. It's good. But there's, it, it's interesting that, you know, for someone who specializes in this, you get measurement feedback, but you're also getting opinions. You're getting people who just troll the comments. 
I'm trying to think you you don't get that type or that level of feedback or trolling or I'm just trying to think of words that cover this mm -hmm. because that's one of the things that I think from a, a mental health standpoint, you're working, you're doing your job, but this feedback is not always the healthiest or the easiest to deal with. Oh, 100% agree with you there, Matt. Some of the other challenges, I guess, is it's a 24-7 thing. So a lot of organizations haven't yet figured out how to stagger their staff in social media to handle the online mm. conversations, regardless of the hour of the day they're coming in, which means that those working in social media strategy or those in community management feel the need to respond quickly because we are in a immediate response culture, right? And so they are having all their notifications on and answering work things well outside of what people would consider a traditional working hour. That can't be good for the mental health, let alone what you're talking about, which is the negative stuff that they are bombarded with every yes. single day. It is crazy how benign of a post, you know, an absolutely unharmful post can go out and yet people will just flock to it with negativity, depending on the brand. Obviously, it doesn't happen to anyone, everyone. If you go and look at a cable company, for example, and see what they're putting out there, I guarantee you that whatever post a large cable company has put out, even if it's highlighting an employee or some great nonprofit work they've done in their community, there are people there who just want to hate on that brand. Right. And there's a human behind it who has to figure out, do we respond? How do we respond? Should I respond or should someone else? Like it, there's just so many pieces to that. Absolutely. And it, and it speaks to the heart of your vocation. This is what I do. And when there is a and it doesn't even have to be constant. It just has to be frequent detractors or trolls or negativity around that. You know, it speaks to your value as to a human or as a worker that I'm, this is my job. And I keep getting this negative negativity focused on me. You know, that does not happen in many, if, if, if any other industry or job where, where you are constant, you know, maybe fast food workers are the only other ones that deal with that amount of negativity on, you know, on a constant basis. And that has got to be another aspect of it, that this is such a public facing type of job. Mm -hmm. And yeah. to get to your point, you know, the social media career report that was put out by Hootsuite showing that social media marketers, yeah, they don't take the vacation time that the average worker takes. They're on their phone at night. They don't, it, it's hard for them to unplug. And so they're much more involved, much more in depth. They're answering these things. And that is a struggle. I can't imagine looking at a job description, if it were honest, and being attracted to that kind of a job. 100% agree with that as well. I, mean, I don't even know what to say, how to respond to that. I'm like, yes, I do. I read some of these posts and I think, first of all, you're blowing smoke, right? Because there's no way that the job is that great. But two, all the things by one person is hard. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, we're seeing the same trends. Our strategists, they're not taking enough of their vacation time. They're not able to unplug. It's affected our community enough that we have really started to highlight that in our continuing education. So we're uh -huh. fairly consistently posting blogs. Our social reminds people of what to do. Shoot the newsletter that's coming out this month. The note for me is all about that, reminding mm -hmm. them of their value, of their worth, and how their contributions make a difference. We've got a, a webinar that we've done on how to help people who are managing social media teams protect their team's mental health. What are some of the processes and procedures organizations can put in place to try to really give this group the ability to step away, to take a breath, and to recharge? Wow. Wow. That's amazing. How would you describe the industry to someone who, you know, 20, 21 years old, they're coming to you and they're saying, Jennifer, I want to go into social media as a career. What can I expect? 
it's hard because even with the data that we are pulling together in our 2024 job study, we highlight the need for a break, for focus on self-care, for continued education, but there are still a lot of positives that are outweighing those negatives. You know, the ability to make a difference in a brand or a community, especially if you're doing something with social responsibility or corporate change, community involvement, right? There's some really great things that happen in this space. So what I like to typically do when I talk to somebody new is I'll ask them questions first about what their perception is around social. What do they like about the idea of it? For some people, it's very clear. They might say, well, I really want to design those amazing memes that everyone shares. Okay, well, that's a graphic designer type role that's a little different. Most social media roles aren't going to focus on that, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. it might be a part of what you do, but it's not a focus. So I'm going to ask them a lot of questions, but then I'm going to be very blunt probably in the response is the best way to put it and say, you know, depending on where you work, this can be a very thankless job. Mm. You have to have some self motivation to get up and do what you're doing. You also have to have the confidence and courage to stand up for yourself in this role whether that be to a community of people where you need to put on the thick skin to, to deal with the negative comments or to say to your management team, this is not inside my scope of response, right? If, right. you know, an example that I think about is in crisis management, mm, your yeah. end yeah. user, community manager or social media manager should not be the person responding to a large corporate crisis, right? There should be a team and a process and Perhaps even legal is involved in what that response looks like, right? And so you as a, a social media professional have to be willing to stand up for yourself and know when it is important to step away, as well as continued education. You cannot go today and think that you know everything and it will just stay that way for the next 20 years because it is not true. So you have to fight for your ability to, to learn, to grow, to connect with other people and share best practices because it is mm -hmm. always evolving. Absolutely. Absolutely. That is a key factor, I think, in any of these digital professions that it's just keeping up with what's changing. And, and I think we've seen just in the past two years, Jennifer, I think just, you know, I'm thinking of all the things across the board digitally, you know, the rise of AI, which is being implemented into Google ads. And, you know, now we're having cookie depreciation and, you know, social media is turning into the, you know, more and more of a legitimate profession. And, you know, just in the past two years, the main uh, technological change, but as you said, also the platform change, it is so significant as what's going on. And so that constant education is a really, it's not just a feature. <laughs> it needs to be built in. <laughs> it really does. And we have to remind ourselves that we can't know everything. We just need to know where to get our answers, right? Mm -hmm. And that is kind of one of the problem solving things for this industry too. If I'm talking to a young person and they just want to sit down and do the job they were told to do, you know, follow the outline. This is not the space for that. You know, and that I think is a great key factor here because, I mean, let's look at what some of the personality traits or the skills that are necessary for social media marketing and that creativity, that innovation is going to be a key factor. It's critical. This is not a profession where you sit and just hit a checklist. This is, <laughs> there is a heavy amount of creative lifting that has to go into it. Needs to know how to use the tool, but anyone working in digital and social specifically probably need to understand how to identify fake images, fake videos, fake news, so that they're not amplifying something in a negative fashion. Mm, yeah. And what you're getting to there, you know, and now we're getting, you know, into a little deeper here of <laughs> when we talk about training, when we talk about certificates or anything like that, it's not necessarily what's the latest algorithm shift or what's the newest feature in paid social. To get to something you said earlier, crisis communication. Mm -hmm. 
that is something that's necessary for further education and furthering your knowledge that, you know, if you're the leader of a social media team or if you're a lone social media person, you are not responsible for crisis comms. Mm -hmm. That is a leadership issue where the company needs to be trained. The company needs to be brought up to speed on if something happens, this is how we respond. And if you are the social media leader or alone, there should be a plan already established for you to follow. And so I think that's where a lot of organizations really drop the ball on that is just ex expecting that because you're in social media, you know how to deal with this. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that you said you should already have that plan because that's true. Too many brands are responding to a crisis in real time in the sense of, wait, let's build the plane while we fly it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> crisis comes is probably not the time to do that, right? So we got to plan for the potential earthquake or whatever might be coming to our brand with the thing mm -hmm. that's going to shake us to the core so that we can respond more quickly in this immediate response culture of a world and that our teams, everyone from the social media person who might first see an indication that something has gone wrong to the C-suite, that they know what their role is, how they respond, when they respond, and what's happening around them for the organization to protect it. Right, right. And to your point, something else that you said about distinguishing, you know, with AI, you know, that gets to just digital literacy, media mm -hmm. literacy. And so if we're looking at a holistic training for not just our social media team, you know, we could throw digital literacy at our entire <laughs> staff, <laughs> you know, you know, that, and that's just smart from a cybersecurity perspective as well, that, you know, when we talk about training, it, it's not just that latest shiny thing that we need to train, there are fundamental things that help the entire business, that mm -hmm. help the entire person if we are training in these things. And so it's a more expansive view, I think, of training, of preparation, rather than just, you know, I think when some people think about social media training, they're thinking about, you know, what's the latest change from Meta on the ad system, whereas it's a bit more expansive than that. Absolutely. I love that you brought up the cybersecurity risks because it's interesting to me to see, you know, large organizations have been putting whole teams together to combat cybersecurity and protect their infrastructure, that of their customers, that of their employees. And yet when it comes to social media, often people are just completely oblivious to the fact that you still have to keep things secure. Like, you can't have one person with all of your online social platform passwords, <laughs> right? Like, wait, why did yes. this just go out the window when we hit social? Like, oh, you know, Susie, she'll handle all of that. She's got all that. It's no problem. She's young. It's when Susie gets <laughs> sick or yeah. leaves or is mad at you. Like, you know, like. <laughs> Oh, well, and that's oh, a so thing. Bad. We haven't grown beyond this understanding because, you, you know, I'm just thinking, you know, I'm going to say back in the day, we would set up Google Analytics and companies would set them up under their own account. And so if you ever separated from that client, you own their analytics. Mm -hmm. And and it's like we haven't grown out of that understanding of ownership of set up a corporate email for these right. accounts. <laughs> and, you know, I every few years, I keep hearing about someone left the company, they deleted the email, now no one has access to anything. Mm -hmm. And, you, you know, yes, it not only hasn't extended to social media, I, I think it just hasn't extended to the understanding of the account level access at these platforms. And somehow that has to be managed and that goes beyond the the team. <laughs> yeah. Businesses are too quick to say, somebody else just do this. Yeah. And unfortunately we have to stop and say, why are we doing this? What is the purpose, right? Who is it for? What are our goals? It's back to the whole foundation of strategy. But yeah, I got off topic there, but, <laughs> but mental health <laughs> well, comes into play. Even I think the cybersecurity it, piece, because yeah. you know, think of Susie on the positive side, right? She's got a lot of pressure if she's the only one who has access to all of that information. Mm -hmm. Because then she feels that obligation to be on 24-7. And that's where we kind of 
derail the mental health of our team. What are some things that that companies and you know we can go with this from a leadership perspective. What are some things that companies should be implementing or should be and I can see maybe other departments maybe pointing the finger like ah special treatment. <laughs> but what are some things leadership can do to number 1 understand the pressure the you know what they are asking what is the ask of a social media marketer or team and what can they do to alleviate or make this a more attractive or more rewarding career yeah i think it all comes down to expectations and i say it so simply but it takes time which is one reason why it hasn't been done if I were to sit down with some leadership, and I've, I've done this over the years, but if a whole group of leaders wanted to sit down, I would tell them to start with their job description. Do they understand what each of the things they're asking that person to do is, first of all? Do they know how long it takes to complete that thing? Hmm. Are there other aspects of performing that duty? that are in the background that they have no knowledge of, right? So, and maybe part of this would be to shadow a team member and have that team member say, okay, this KPI, right, on my job description says that I need to create content for our social channels. Well, how many channels is that? How many pieces of content does that look like? A little sneak peek, according to our 2024 job review, more than half of the social media strategists that we spoke with manage four or more social platforms for their brand. Yep. Wow. That's one person. Wow. Seven platforms. Multiply that by 30 days or 31 days in a month. Mm -hmm. And then if, if Twitter happens to be one of them, for example, <laughs> on that platform. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you can't just post, you know, blog posts all day long from your repertoire of, you know, 4 million that you might have on your web website. So what, how many images do they have to create? Are they creating videos to play in that space? If YouTube is one of the platforms that they're managing, that's all video, right? Like, so just understanding how much they're asking that person to do is going to be helpful in understanding they, one, aren't staffed properly, mm -hmm. or two, need to better clarify who does what in the team. Right. Instead of just saying, you all are in charge of these, you know, 100 items, helping people say, okay, no, this is, you're the graphic designer, you're the video editor, you're the content writer, you're the social media community manager, you each kind of contribute right to the team but you also have your main focus and understanding that that's what they manage mm -hmm. that's where i'd start and then from there it is to really have them take a look at some of the negativity that they receive if they are doing that community management piece so they have some understanding about how the brand can support them in relationship to what's going out there in that world whether it is some time off or um, more staff, or setting some expectations that this brand won't respond to comments after X hour mm. because of our team. You know, sometimes we just right. need to be willing to set that expectation with mm -hmm. our customers. Yeah, That was kind no. of a long answer, but it's- No, I love it. And I'm going to break it down into two areas that we're going to dive okay. into a little more. All right. And you brought up something at the end there about not- responding quickly and I'm going to make a note because let's do this one first. We're going to go <laughs> we're going to go okay. in a reverse order. Not right. responding. Jennifer, let me ask you this. And, and do you feel it is absolutely essential? You just answered it. So but I'm going to ask you this straight out. Mm -hmm. Is it absolutely essential that you have to answer a negative comment that moment? Why? No. <laughs> <laughs> because sometimes a negative comment is just meant to to be negative, right? And to your point about trolls and, and people who are just you know, doom scrolling and commenting and adding negativity into the space, sometimes they don't respond. We don't need any response, right? Mm -hmm. If somebody is out there just 
being negative, being a troll. I'm trying to use good words here. Like if they're just trying to be the worst of humanity, we don't need to respond to them. Right. Right. The community online, the people that have, you know, a few brain cells that are really thinking critically, they realize that person just is naughty. Right. Mm -hmm. If it's negative in the sense of your brand has messed up something, your product or service has got a problem. I can't solve it, right? Like it's a legitimate negative concern. Yeah, we need to be as quick as possible on that because it can fester, right? Mm -hmm. Like it can create this feeling of you guys don't care. You're not paying Mm -hmm. attention. And so now, you know, Joe's got a problem, but now Malcolm has another problem and his problem wasn't really as big as Joe's but because Joe's not getting a response now, Malcolm feels like he needs to help by sharing he also has had this problem, yeah. right? So it's all it comes down to discerning that comments, putting something up. So especially a small brand, you can put something up on your social channels that say, you know, we only monitor this channel between the hours of, you know, eight to seven or whatever. Yeah. And most people will respect that. Mm -hmm. Now, could Nike do that and get away with it? No, right? Because they've got more than one person handling their social media. But if it's a small mom and pop brand, most people will realize that they'll put their comment or complaint out there and expect to get something in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to respond to everything and you don't have to do it right away. Yeah. Well, and especially sometimes I think we act like there's no other channel. There's no other recourse. There's no other possible way that somebody could you know lodge a complaint or you know we have got customer service lines we've got everyone's got you know chat or something like that but sometimes i think we just way overestimate i'm going to get into a little bit of my you know view of of social media conflicts i feel like they come and go Mm -hmm. your brand may be at the center of a controversy today and it may feel like the end of the world but next week it's going to be somebody else and, you know, over time of social media, it's just, it, it's funny. I remember one, this was years ago, and I can't even remember the brand. That should say something. But it was for like three weeks. It was one of the top stories. And then about a month later, you know, I heard someone saying, well, that was a tempest in a teapot. You know, that <laughs> that blew over fast. And it, it's, I think that's the nature of social is that it is constantly changing and you could be in the spotlight for negative reasons, but someone else will be soon enough. And, but I think when you're in it, that is when the pressure is on. You don't see the end of it. You don't see how's this going to resolve and where the attention of the media on us. You know, if you're a larger brand dealing with that pressure, if you're not prepared for it, that is what causes mistakes. That's what causes people to just, forget that there this will end <laughs> it, it it will go you know will go on but again that kind of gets back to your point about the training the expectations of this if this happens this is how we're going to deal with it and if that's not there then you know you can't imagine the amount of pressure you're putting on people if they're not prepared for it oh yeah it can feel like the end of the world i get that and so i It's kind of interesting because in my community on social, you know, if I even just think about Twitter or X, call it what you want, but Twitter, it will be for me forever. But on that platform, I've got a lot of social media people, right? And so the minute some sort of crisis hits the news, there's a whole bunch of people who are sending positivity to whomever manages the social (laughs) channels of that brand. And so, I mean, in some ways it warms my heart. It's like all these people who don't know each other can That's feel cool. that pain and are trying to help support, you know, that individual. They may not ever see those comments, you know, but we get it. Each one of us who deal with that pressure understand how end of the world it can feel in that mm-hmm. moment. If we're prepared for it though, it doesn't have to be that scary. We can kind of go through the motions until our time passes and the next brand is in the highlight or in the hot seat. That's amazing that there is that community out there. And we'll talk about that towards the end, because I think that's something that I think needs to be brought forth a lot more, that there is a community 
-hmm. of people that do this who understand what you're going through. And boy, to have that kind of support in a crisis or a negative situation, I can't imagine how that would help. That is so, so cool. I'm glad that you're involved with that. Hey everyone, this is Matt, and thanks for listening. Just a quick break in the middle of the podcast here to let you know there's a couple ways that you can connect with us. The first is learn.sitelogic.com. That's the learning site where you can see courses on analytics, courses on digital marketing across paid search, SEO, multiple disciplines. And then also you can connect with us on Slack. Go to Slack if you're there and look for us at endlesscoffeecup.slack.com. Connect with us. I'd love to hear from you. Hear what ails you in the realm of digital marketing. Are there courses you need, information that you'd like to hear, or maybe some past guests that you'd like to hear more from? Thanks again for being a listener of the Endless Coffee Cup, and I look forward to hearing from you. The second thing I wanted to get into, and you had talked about this as far as the job requirements and, you know, bringing up, I was working on some, you know, a training video and just taking the top four social sites that take video. And the concept that, and you had talked about this of like, who does this and what do they do? If I'm putting video on the top four social sites, I have a different requirement for each site, different resolution, different format, different aspect. And, and so if I'm producing high quality video across multiple platforms, from a leadership standpoint, I think a lot of times it's just assumed, oh, we're producing video and we're getting it out there. Getting it out there. I like that. But <laughs> what's involved with getting it out there <laughs> it's <laughs> you are recutting the same video multiple meth multiple ways and for different platforms and if it's not shot correctly you can't do it and you know it won't fit what you want it to look like what the you know what your brand is typically putting out and so i think those types of details are overlooked constantly in job descriptions and leadership expectations and just, hey, could you get this out on social media? The tactical functions of just getting video out across channels is completely overlooked. Absolutely. I was going to say some sort of smart ass comment like, you mean I can't just do it all on my phone? Isn't that what they're doing? And yes, we can do much on our phones. But to your point, sometimes if what you're focusing in on is video, you need some hardware, you need some software, you need some things to make all of the processes come together so you can do the different aspect ratios, you can do the different cuts, you can make sure that they look good in each of those instead of, oh, by the time we're done and working on something for you know YouTube, it's the most grainy, looks like you've filmed it on a, you know, I don't even know VHS recorder from the eighties, like, <laughs> one of those, but <laughs> yeah. And, and then, you know, and that's just the functional part of it. it. It's how are you editing it for YouTube as compared to TikTok, as compared to Instagram, as compared to LinkedIn, you're going to edit it differently. And, and hopefully because you know what your attention rate is on each of these platforms, you know, how quickly you've got to get to the point and also your call to action or whatever it is you're putting in there. And so those videos aren't going to be the same length. They're not going to have the same content. I don't think that level of understanding is accessible to a lot of people that are defining the, the performance of the job. Right. Well, you just said a, a very interesting word that sparked a comment on that. Accessible. So mm -hmm. we are also championing accessibility in social which means, okay, those videos that you're done, now let's caption them. <laughs> but if you don't have the right tool, it doesn't just happen automatically. And a lot of people think, well, just use the, you know, the, the YouTube captioning YouTube, tool. Yeah. Okay. But did you edit it? Did you check it? Our different dialects, right. our different accents, the AI will pick up words that were not actually said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so there's more time and energy that comes into that. And then if you're looking at taking some of that content and you want to put it on reels or you want to put it on talk, 
what about that fun text over the top, you know, in blue or yellow or whatever, and the stuff that comes in and fades out and the fun little buttons that pop up, all of that takes time, right? Yes. All of that takes energy in a different mm -hmm. format. And what it takes is someone who understands editing video, which mm -hmm. is not always your social media person. <laughs> No, I don't know too many social media people who got into it because they loved video editing. Absolutely. And that is something, you know, even with my my social media here, it's I, I constantly have to remind myself, I can't just throw a video project at them. Mm -hmm. It's not that's not the skill set that I hired. And, and so it, but it is so easy, I think, for managers just to, hey, you guys work on this. You put videos up all the time. You know what you're doing. <laughs> yep. You're scope. digital. You know everything digital. Yeah, scope creep. <laughs> exactly, hundred <laughs> percent. Oh yeah. Well, it, it's my daughter is a photographer, and she says the amount of times they just assume I know video editing is just beyond. And, and she has to explain to them, "This is I don't use the same software. I don't deal in the same world, but yeah. because it's a camera, <laughs> you know, it's got to be the same." It's so crazy how we make assumptions about what other people do. It's got to be easy. Oh, yeah. Right. Right. Well, and that's I. so in my training, I asked this question and, and you, you may appreciate it because in, ter in terms of accessibility, I ask people, how many here do tech support for their parents or grandparents? And usually half the room, you know, their hands are up mm -hmm. and it, it's a great way to open up a session because now, okay, what's your typical problem? What are they typically running into? And we get into error messaging. We get into UX, UI. We get into, and I said half the time, you know, most of the time when I am helping my mother, it's not her fault. I'd say 99% of the time, it is not her fault. The site doesn't work. It's not clear. It's not functioning correctly. The error messaging is horrible. Mm -hmm. So why are we blaming old people on the inability to use the technology? Y you know, it, and so it, it creates another level of empathy, I, I think, among marketers, designers, that we can be pretty lazy sometimes when we're designing interfaces. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. You know, so that getting to that accessibility, but, you know, but they're the, we're usually the first ones that say, you know, you know, they always need a young person. You know, you must be in computers. You can help me. <laughs> but there is a truth to that, that you're comfortable with interfaces that don't give full instructions, I think is the more accurate thing to say. <laughs> yeah, they're not afraid. I think the younger generation, for the most part, isn't afraid to push the button. Yeah. You know, where the older generation thinks they're going to launch a nuclear warhead or yes. something if they push yes. the wrong button. <laughs> the younger generation's like, what? Something bad could happen? Yep. But the reality is, is, yeah, you're right. We need to do a better job of designing it for, one, our audience, but two, for people who may not have exposure to the understanding that we have. And that happens in marketing all the time. Simple things like reminding your marketing team to put a call to action on there. What do you want them to do when they've yes. consumed your content? Yes. <laughs> we forget that. We just assume that people know we want them to go to our site and buy something or sign up for something. No. Mm -hmm. It's not an easy assumption, especially when we're making a parody of some trend. Like, we don't always tie the which is also why we don't need to jump on every trend but mm -hmm. you know to to your point we have to make it easy we have to help Absolutely. them with design i think the first three months when i had hired someone the first three months all she heard me say was contrast more contrast it, it was just constantly I'm like it's not contrasting enough <laughs> it was and i think she got sick of me saying it but you know and, and eventually i'm showing like this is what i'm seeing this is how I see it. This is, and so, you know, and now, you know, you get it. But I think yeah. part of that is you have to see what it looks like in someone else's eyes. And I have always been a, you know, an advocate of yeah. high contrast. <laughs> Your eyes will go to high contrast. This is what yeah. we want people to do. So yeah, some of those other lessons of simple design techniques, understanding a little more of the neuroscience of how we look at and evaluate information within a few seconds. I'll never forget, we spent years doing eye tracking studies and that was probably the most valuable type of training, of learning 
where do people look and why? And what does that do to the brain when they see certain things? Really helps you develop that empathy for your users, for your followers, and communicating much better in order to get that information across. Yeah. It's powerful what we can learn from people. And sometimes <laughs> we have to just ask them. Yeah. Right? Like, oh. What is it that you want from us? What do you like about this channel, this brand, this conversation? You know, what don't you like? What can we do more of? Okay. You just opened up like my last, <laughs> the last point I want to dig <laughs> into content. Yes. Now, I, I feel like to some that's a dirty word because we, you know, that's all we hear content. I love how, you know, our transition here was are we even asking our audience if we're giving them what they want? That is a big question to ask when it comes to the content we produce. Usually the answer is no. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> and we don't realize that because we just see what, you know, why is my engagement rate so low? Or why are people not visiting our site? Or, you know, we look at the data behind it and we go, something's wrong with our people. Yes. <laughs> No, something's wrong with our content, right? We may not be giving them what they need at this moment. And it doesn't always mean that the content we're providing isn't helpful. It might mm. not be timely, right? Mm. It might not be what the majority of them need right now, which I think in some ways contradicts the whole conver or sentence I made earlier about trends. We don't need to jump on all the latest trends, but we do need to be aware of the cycle that our consumers are going through. Let me see if I can give a off the cuff good example, but I think of higher ed, right? Mm -hmm. You're probably not doing a ton of marketing for new applicants in May, June, or July. People are not in their brain or in their mindset of, hey, I need to think a year and three months out right. to apply to college, right? What the content is for someone in those months, May, June, July, are probably congratulations messages for those that are graduating, whether they're graduating high school or college, support, what to do next, what does career planning look like, what do summer internships, you know, sound like? What does the campus got going on in the summer, right? It kind of depends on what your goals and objectives are, but your content will look different then as opposed to like November, December, mm -hmm. when that is when all the applications are due. That is when people want information, not on what your cool little mascot is doing, but when does the FAFSA need to be filled in? When does well, my application need to FAFSA. be there? I know. I should. <laughs> don't. Dear listener, I if you have dealt trauma. with FAFSA, you know what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. I just did my, I just did the new version. Yep. And oh my gosh, there's all kinds of trauma with that. But anyways, <laughs> you know, we need right to know there. those things. Yep. When the cycle is happening. And each of our brands has a cycle like that. Education is the one I chose, one, because it's my background, but two, I think most of us, can understand, even if we didn't go to a traditional four-year college, we can understand the process of, well, school typically starts in August or September, and it goes through May or June. So there is a cycle, right? There's different mm -hmm. things that we need in those times. Our brands do that too. And so we've got to be aware of those and provide value during those tough times. And I encourage folks often to just simply ask questions. You know, one of the things we do in our newsletters are send out occasional, real short, one or two question surveys or mm -hmm. a simple hit reply and tell us what you need today, mm -hmm. right? Because we don't always know. Mm -hmm. And so when we're trying to think of continuing education opportunities, if we're trying to bring new speakers in, whatever the case may be, it's best to ask, what is it that you need? I felt like 2023, we did a ton in analytics with our current conversion to GA4. A lot of social need to understand how does this connect with what they're measuring, right? But the one thing I got in December of last year was we want more analytics, platform specific here in this case. And I felt like we had just done so much in analytics last year that they would be overwhelmed by that. Nope, they still need more. Yep. So yep. if I wouldn't ask, I wouldn't know. Yeah. Well, and you bring up a great point that 
so you know you're talking about a content calendar mm -hmm. and which hopefully is like the number one tool of any social marketer is having that calendar and planning out that content because one of the big things i hear is running out of ideas running out of content ideas and which is completely foreign to me and maybe because i've been in this industry but also because I do a hefty amount of research. As you were saying, the more research you're doing, the more you're going to be prepared for what's relevant, what's timely, what's needed. And so when I hear people talk about I'm running out of content ideas, to me it's like, oh, <laughs> you know, there's so much that you could be doing. And I think this gets also to the maybe the lack of a formal education about being a social media marketer, that what are, you know, here are the things that are going to make you successful. Here are the things that the tools that you will need. And how do you put together a content calendar for, you know, let's look at 18 to 24 months rather than, you know, just this month or next month. I'm not sure there's enough that really, you know, at this point, we can call it fundamentals. But is it being taught as fundamentals? Are these critical subjects that, you know, we are, and we, yeah, I could keep going on that as far as, you know, how can we get into secondary education and help this and get these things in? Taught in our curriculum, mm -hmm. in our textbook, we even have a free downloadable content calendar, kind of a starter, right? But the reality is, I think we forget as we, and I don't want to say forget. As we get wrapped up in our day to day, a lot of social media marketers let certain things go. And those fundamentals are often those things because what they're being asked to do is more seemingly more important, mm -hmm. right? So they have to jump on that fire or handle that situation. There are constant conversations happening in this space about the leadership who comes and says, Hey, I've got a really great idea for you for content. Cool. We did that yesterday. Or are you going to implement that? Or did you know that we're not talking to those people anymore in our strategies? Like whatever the case may be, right? Usually it's very off topic. But then even as internal struggles we have as marketers is we want to be seen as cutting edge or maybe edgy or at least creative, right? So we forget a really important fundamental, which is repurposing evergreen content. Yeah. We have spent time, and I guarantee almost everybody, right, in their brand has spent time and money to create some collateral, some content, and publish something beautiful, whether it be a research study, a video, or whatever, and we share it when it's new, but we forget that we can repurpose that bad boy, oh. right? We can take snippets of that video or quotes and put it into an image form, or we can do a spinoff blog post, or we can interview someone on the topic. I mean, there's just so much oh. that we can do to repurpose the content we already have. We should not run out of ideas, but it doesn't seem in our brains as creative, as fresh, as new, but our audience needs the repetition, yeah. right? They need to see or hear certain things numbers of times in different ways in order for it to sink in. Well, I think you bring up something very important here is that when it's your company, your social media, you live in it every day. And so you get mm -hmm. tired of it. Yep. Whereas, and I would use this in my teaching that, okay, when you're creating an email welcome series, take the content from your website and put it in your email series. That's because I guarantee you they've not read it. And if they have read it, they don't remember it. Because mm -hmm. we, and especially I see this in you know web developers, you're in it every day. And so it's repetitive, it's tiring. But to our audience, it's they've maybe been exposed once or twice that month to our content. And so there is that pressure of, we feel like we've got to do something new, edgy, Whereas yeah. our audience does, it has not been exposed to it nearly as many times as we think they have. And yeah, that I think inhibits that, that sense of let's create something out of this and let's build on what we've, what we've already built. Let's build on it. Let's create something. And, and that is something I know I do in my training courses is, you know, you can create an asset 
that's a resource for the next years if you do it right. And so that, but I think that closeness to the project, that closeness to working it every day, that's what wears people out. And they think they got to do something new after that. Yeah. Yep. And that's where the calendar helps, right? It's because you can kind of make a longer picture and say, oh, well, I didn't really talk about this as frequently as I thought I did. Right. So we can mm -hmm. bring it in. Mm -hmm. But it's just that reminder. And yeah, if you need energy and excitement, your audience is the best place to look for ideas and fresh content. Absolutely. Well, Jennifer, thank you so much. This has been such a great conversation, getting to hear a little bit more about what you're doing. And I'm looking forward to the upcoming study. And so, dear listener, if you want to know more and more about this study, I highly recommend you go to nism.org, right? <laughs> NISM online. Oh, NIS, yep. NISM online. We'll, we'll put the links in the show page. But Jennifer, just a word, if you could talk to us about the community, NISM. We talked about it briefly earlier when you talked about, you know, being supportive of those that are maybe going through a really tough time. The value of having a community of other social media marketers and, you know, what NISM offers. If you could talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, so it's been fun to watch our community grow and evolve over the years. As we chatted about the last time I was here, we offer an industry standardized certification, so an exam that credentials folks in social media strategy. And so our core community is made up of those certified strategists who have passed that exam or going through continuing education. But we also have what I would call kind of the outer circle of that community, those people who maybe haven't yet gone through the exam, but are in this field trying to learn from those experts in that core. And they both lift each other up in different ways. So the core community, we have some closed groups in which they can share best practices, collaborate, and also, you know, complain if they need to or vent about the things that are going on in their world. But then we have a more open community where you can come to webinars that we host a couple times a month. You can join the conversations online and possibly in person soon. So more come on that one where you can learn from others, support others, and really lift up the work that, that folks are doing. And what has been fun for me is kind of what I alluded to earlier is watching them really support and lift each other up, especially through COVID, mm. right? when all we had was a computer screen to talk to and everyone was scared and angry, right? To now in this post-COVID world where people are still a little scared and angry, but more involved both in person and online in what our brands are doing. And so they're kind of catching us in a variety of methodologies, if you will, and, and methods and forms. So yeah, it's just really a great community, really smart people. I love surrounding myself with smart people. And I'm just very grateful, right, to be able mm -hmm. to lead this organization of smart people that are way smarter than me, and that are lifting <laughs> each other up and moving this industry forward. So that's amazing. And yeah, I can't suggest that enough. I know I'm going to go back the early days of SEO. One of the things that was so, so helpful was having an online forum of people to go to and talk to. And sharing, you know, our successes, our failures, and what are you seeing? And how does this, that community of people that you can rely on, that can support you, that can help you figure out a problem is so invaluable. And, you know, and then to be able to meet most of them mm -hmm. in person, really just transform the entire relationship. I highly, highly recommend if you are a social media marketer, and you're not in this alone. There are other people with the same trials and tribulations as you. So I would highly suggest seek out nismonline.org, look up NISM and join the community. I highly recommend it. Jennifer, thank you so much for your time today. I have really appreciated it and appreciate everything you're doing in the industry.
Thanks for having me again, Matt. It's always great to talk with you. All right. Dear listener, I hope this has been helpful. And especially if you are looking to get into the social media marketing industry, hey, here's some straight talk from someone who's there who is heavily involved in the industry. If you have any questions at all about social media marketing as a vocation, as a job, as a career, you can contact Jennifer or myself. would love to talk with you about what's involved with that and how you can get started or restarted in a new career in social media marketing. Until then, I look forward to our next cup of coffee on the Endless Coffee Cup podcast. You've been listening to the Endless Coffee Cup. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with somebody else. And of course, please take just a moment and rate or review us at your favorite podcast service. If you need more information, contact me at sitelogicmarketing.com. Thanks again for being such a great listener. Listener.